well, in the course of, uh, you know, realize, we realized uh, in the course of doing our work over the past couple of years that we had done a significant amount of residential projects, all that were uh, of varying degrees of sustainability. Uh, the Helena, there's a mixed-use project called Clinton Green or the Mosaic. Uh, we had done this work in Mary Park City, and in the lower right, uh, the aforementioned uh, 31st Street Tower that's done in association with Durst and Alf Edner's group. Um, and there were some surprising statistics. These all achieved various levels of lead rating. Uh, and what we put together is something we call Four Shades of Green. And I, I won't go into the whole thing because it's actually a whole lecture unto itself. But what's interesting to note, you see across the top of the chart, let's see if I get this to work. All right, so what you see across uh, here are all of the lead points by category. And depending on how many of the projects achieve the point, the shade of the green gets darker. So you can see that almost a, a lot of the points were done in sustainable sites or so in an urban environment. We easily meet the local proximity to mass transit here in the city. Um, and the red are the points that no one got. And surprisingly, all of these residential projects, which range from uh, certified to silver, oh, and gold, if uh, Helena comes through, uh, none of them really achieved much success in, in terms of the energy performance. Um, and it was surprising because, as someone who is on the board of the Green Building Council, that it would be possible to achieve that much success uh, without at least getting some uh, accruement of points in, a, in one particular category, especially one that was traditionally as important as energy uh, efficiency. And this led to, uh, this research actually led to us meeting with the mayor's office uh, to uh, enhance some of the language that's now in Local Law 86, which again is the city's proposed, or it's actually enacted, uh, sustainable legislation. Um, and we were again very fortunate to be in a position to have uh, the data and the analysis from our own work to be able to put this together. Um, I, I won't get into it too much, but it, I, I think it's quite visually obvious that there is a hole in the system here. Uh, you know, and I talked about lead, and, and there are other uh, measuring sticks as well. You know, it's important uh, in this era of marketing power that we not uh, fall prey to greenwash, is the industry term for it. Uh, and you know, we have LEED, we also have the Green Building Challenge, and there's also, in England, there's this thing called BRE's Environmental Assessment Method. And I think too often, uh, because LEED has been so successful as a market transformer, that it's become like Kleenex or tissue, you know, it's like the brand, and people think LEED means green, or LEED means sustainable. And, and even though, again, I'm an advocate of LEED because of all the wonderful things it does, I don't think it's quite fair to say that if you're not a LEED project, you're not doing the right thing. Um, and it certainly is not uh, the same as tissue or Kleenex or however you want to brand it. Um, and there are other uh, things that can be done, and there are other opportunities uh, to do the right thing that go beyond just the matrix I showed you on the previous slide. Um, I'll talk about the pros of leads, since I am on the board, and Bruce will talk about the cons. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it does promote a common language. Uh, you know, before LEED, people would talk about things and say, oh, this is green, or this is great, or, you know, this is, it has recycled content. Well, how much recycled content? What does that mean? And, you know, one person's, you know, post-consumer is another person's post-industrial. And, and, you know, what it did was it gave us all a common vocabulary. And it also gave us a verifiable means of evaluation. You know, it had tangible uh, metrics that you can apply to evaluate your building. Sometimes those metrics are a little bit onerous, uh, but it's important that they're there because then you have a real benchmark to evaluate your project. And everyone who goes through LEED has the same benchmark, and so you get a true uh, measure of sustainability. There are very clear objectives, there are great goals, you know, there are prerequisites. Um, there aren't enough prerequisites that help us in the urban environment, but I think that's you know, going to come because LEED continues to evolve and it continues to be a flexible product, and it's, that's evident in the release of some of the new products, like lead for existing buildings, lead for uh, commercial interiors. Um, on a side note, it, it's surprising to me that the market penetration for lead EV or existing buildings hasn't uh, uh, really taken hold here in the city. When you consider the vast building stock of existing buildings we have and the amounts of square footage we're talking about, uh, you know, if anyone is interested in uh, reading more about the EDB or, or LEED in general, you should definitely go to the U.S. Green Building Council website because uh, uh, there are only so many opportunities to use raw virgin materials and, and, and 
in the right way, but for new construction, where we have a huge, huge existing um, infrastructure here of, of buildings that can be reused or readapted. Uh, so maybe LEDB will be the next big thing after we finish with IEQ. And I, I guess if you're in this business, you talk in a lot of syllables and stuff like that. So. What is particularly uh, grating to architects, particularly, is that there's no recognition of design excellence. You can build the ugliest building in the world and get a lead rating. Uh, it really can have a very negative effect on quality of life, on, on uh, compatibility of, of neighborhoods and so forth. Um, and I, I don't know whether that's something they're advancing or not. Are they, are they even mm -hmm. talking about that? They, they are talking about it, but it's, it's, again, it's difficult for a metrics-based evaluation tool to talk about subjective things. Um, but it's a very real concern on the part of the design community because uh, if we're going to truly maximize the resources that go into something, it really has to function for a long, long time. Uh, we're fortunate that we work for developers that don't uh, believe in flipping and uh, hold on to their uh, developments as resources for their for their grandchildren. And so they're uh, keen on doing things that last hundreds of years, not 10 minutes. Um, but there really isn't right now a way to address that. Uh, another problem is that because it is so democratic, so to speak, there are so many categories that you, you get your points from uh, and, and mandated or, or uh, what they call prerequisites, uh, <clears throat> that it really has become a point game. Uh, and it's different. I was on a jury for the Boston Society of Architects uh, Sustainability uh, Designs Awards last year. And it was it's really uh, sad to see that it's, it's, it's more a talk about how they got their weak points for those and really doing things that are, are taking it to the next level. It's almost like it's plateaued. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a serious concern because you can have the most climate neutral, total innovate, totally innovative building in the world and not be able to be ready because you don't have bicycle racks or you haven't, uh, you haven't met one of these other requirements. Well, I also think it's important to note that not all points cost the same. Uh, we'll talk maybe briefly about cost in a second, but if something like the land, which has a black water treatment system, which means every ounce of water that goes into that building gets recycled, only gets one point. You also get a point for low flow fixtures. Uh, the cost difference is millions of dollars. Uh, so there isn't much incentive in the points game, as Bruce alluded to, to actually pushing for the more uh, appropriate or correct conservation measure, which is to not put any water back into the city sewer system. But if it's going to cost a million dollars for a point, you're going to think about it. So that, that's what we mean by life's uh, rewards for innovation. Um, and also, uh, it is a work in progress, but we're frustrated many times because if we're doing a canvas project, for example, uh, and, and there's a central system of, uh, say, cogeneration, which is the greenest possible system you could have, because that gen there's no generation of, of power on site, uh, you have to make up, get your points some other way to the point where it becomes very impractical. And, and we know that the, the U.S. Green Building Council is working on that. Um, and it's, it's the whole uh, market penetration, as, as Peter says, we're disappointed. Uh, a number of owners are just saying, well, why should I bother to do this? Uh, I'm doing the right thing. It's important that they are doing the right thing. Uh, but the U.S. Green Building Council really has to think about how they can make it more tangible from 